For those that don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Ron Lasky here at Thayer School. And our speaker today is uh, Stuart B. Nelson. He's a graduate of American University, University of Rhode Island, and has his PhD from University of Southern California. Stu's professional life has focused mostly on oceanography, but has been flavored with uh, many diverse experiences, including uh, a congressional, being a congressional fellow and working with the National Alcohol Fuel Commission. And he's also been involved in many projects using blimps. Uh, he has been to no, bo both the North and South Pole, and what he's going to share with us today is uh, one of his passions. Um, and so without further ado, Dr. Nelson. Thank you very much, uh, Ron, for that uh, introduction. And I'm delighted to be here uh, for my very first time in Hanover and, of course, uh, Dartmouth uh, College. So whoever I have to thank for the weather, thank you, because it was not what I was expecting when I checked it a few days ago is what was going to uh, be here. So I forgot to mention one thing. Yes. Uh, at oh. the end of Stu's talk, there's going to be a book signing, because he has written a book about this. And I am the first person to purchase one today. I'd like, like to have some others, so I think that's going to be right, right down here. Yes, fortunately there are a few left. <laughs> Don't make me take them back on the plane. Uh, when I was doing some projects on blimps, I got very interested in the of passenger airships. Primarily the airships were, we may be most familiar with, are those German airships, the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg. And it was when I was researching the Graf Zeppelin that I read that it was going to rendezvous with the North Pole in 1931 with a submarine called the Nautilus. And frankly, I had never heard of this submarine before. The only Nautilus I was familiar with was the nuclear submarine Nautilus that in 1958 had succeeded, world's first nuclear submarine, had succeeded in going across the Arctic Ocean by way of the North Pole. A Nautilus 1931, no idea. So I started to look into it, and the more I did, the more thrilled I became with this story. So it is a pleasure to be able to share it with you. I know we have here a lot of people who were involved, of course, in engineering. But whether it's engineering or whether it's oceanography, the successful application involves more than just the science. It also involves the state of technology, the economic conditions that exist, social values that may govern uh, the application, uh, and competitive factors. And this story today involves many of those kinds of other considerations. And so let me tell you about this particular subject of mine, Sir Hubert Wilkins and his submarine called the Nautilus. What you are looking at here is the plaque that was on this submarine Nautilus. And indeed the name comes from Jules Verne's fictional submarine, the Nautilus, from his book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And we adopted that plaque. I have it here on my cap as a matter of fact. The Latin inscription, again from Jules Verne's book, uh, means moving within the moving element. So the submarine moving within the moving waters of the ocean. Uh, we, as I said, adopted it and just added on the bottom those words that we used on our uh, shirts that we made for the project, for the search operation, and for the caps. This is the submarine Nautilus of 1931. Perhaps unlike any other submarine that you have ever seen. It was a U.S. Navy World War I vintage craft, and I'll explain a bit more of the history as we go on, but just real quickly, this whole structure up here added for this Arctic expedition was wood. Wood. On a hydraulic ram in case they ran into any large ice floats. 
a bridge made of canvas and pipe rail that could be broken down, and iron sled runners so they could guy glide along on the underside of the Arctic ice pack, and a bunch of other features that I will note as well. That's yours truly. That is the man submersible that I used for this particular project. And that's sort of the hero of my story. That is Sir Hubert Wilkins. He was the one who led this expedition in 1931. This was a civilian undertaking. And here you see him, obviously a staged photo. If you'll notice his feet, he has on his Oxford and no socks. <laughs> sort of the Miami look. <laughs> now, Sir Hubert Wilkins was born George Hubert Wilkins, about 120 miles, and forgive me, I'm not going to use metric, I'll just be consistent with, with this. He was born about 120 miles north of Adelaide in Australia in the year 1888. He was the youngest of 13 children. His mother was 50 when he was born. I was not able to find a birth certificate for him. And there's some controversy as to whether or not she was actually his birth mother or whether it was in fact an older sister. But regardless, he recognized his mother as being his mother. Well, they had a huge station there in a place called Mount Bryan East. They raised uh, some sheep, some vegetables, but drought was a perennial problem. When George was uh, growing up and going to school, it was a simple structure about seven miles away from where they lived. Interesting enough, the teacher that taught at this simple school resided with the Wilkins family. And so George would have to travel every morning with the teacher to school. Horrible situation, if I may say so myself. When he was a teenager, his parents turned over the station to one of his older brothers. And they moved to Adelaide, down on the coast. Here, George enrolled in what we would call a vocational school. And he was studying electrical engineering. When it came time for George to graduate, subject to taking his examination, he didn't take it. As he would explain later in his life, he did not sit for the exam because he feared that if he failed it, it would disappoint his parents. And not wanting to disappoint his parents, he didn't take the examination. Now, George did have a great facility for electrical engineering. And this was a time when these transient uh, movie companies would come to town, set up a tent, and show silent moving pictures. The projectors were always breaking down and George was productively employed fixing projectors. Pretty soon they were asking him to shoot some of the movies that they were making. And pretty soon George became a fairly accomplished videographer. But at the age of 19, George Hubert Wilkins, like so many youth then in southern Australia, wanted to see the world. And so he stowed away on a ship out of Adelaide Harbor. And thus began a whole series of adventures. 